Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. Corbin Dallas and I are super excited about today's episode. We've got Japan's new space policy, U.S.-Japan Space Collaboration for you. Before we get started and I introduce our host, I'd like to remind you, you can find us on Twitter. We're at hashtag the Space Policy Show, or you can ask your questions on Vimeo in the dialog box below. And we would love it, Corbin and I would love it if you would sign up for news alerts. You can go to our website at aerospace.org slash policy. And you can click stay up to date, put your email in, and you'll get signed up and you will get the latest and greatest from us. Today's episode, oops, sorry, Corbin's moving around a little bit. Today's episode is a panel covering Japan, including its recent missile and missile defense activity and the security implications of its new space policy that came out at the end of June. Sam Wilson from the Center for Space Policy and Strategy will be moderating a panel, which includes Frank Januzzi, Masashi Murano, and Sayuri Romay. Sam leads much of our international space work in CSPS, in addition to covering missile and nuclear command and control issues. Relevant to today's discussion, he authored a paper about Japan's shift toward a focus on space security capabilities, which we released back in May. And he's written other articles about Japan's defense space activity. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Sam. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, this is uh, Japan released its new space policy at the end of June. Um, this is Japan's first space policy since 2016. In general, this new space policy reflects a lot of continuity with uh, Japan's ongoing space security initiatives. Although there is this this one new bit that I want us to pull on today um, about early warning. Specifically, Japan says um, in the policy that. In cooperation with the United States, um, it will uh, study small satellite constellations with infrared sensor technology for the purposes of missile warning. Currently, only the United States and Russia have their own early warning satellite systems. So, as we will discuss today, you know, I think um, you know Japan developing its its own. If Japan were to develop its own early warning satellite system, uh, that would be significant not just in terms of the Japan's military capabilities, but also in terms of the U.S.-Japan uh, defense-based relationship. And, and it's also this nice, um, this nice hook uh, into some of Japan's other missile and missile defense activity this summer that, that I want us to chat about. So with that, I, I'll introduce the, the panelists. Um, situated next to me is uh, Sayuri Romai. She is um, at RAND Corporation. Um, she is the Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow there. Welcome to the FFRDC world, uh, Sayuri. Uh, before that, she was uh, at the uh, Wilson Center and before that at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. And then moving clockwise, um, uh, next is Masashi Murano, who is the Japan Chair Fellow at the Hudson Institute. Um, Masashi also uh, contributes to classified analyses for Japan's government on defense issues. And then last, we have Frank Januzzi, who is the president and CEO of the Mike and Marine Mansfield Foundation. Um, there, Frank uh, oversees the foundation's programs, including the U.S.-Japan Space Forum. Um, also relevant to the discussion today, Frank uh, used to serve as the policy director um, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, for um, Pacific Affairs and East Asia. So I should also mention that uh, all three of you were critical to a paper that we issued in May on Japan's uh, shift to uh, a space security uh, space security con uh, construct. Um, I, I quoted in the paper, Frank and Masashi and, and Sayuri served as a peer reviewer. Uh, so thank you so much. I, I, I'm really grateful that all three of you are able to participate today. You know, I think each of you have different and interesting vantage points that that will be really that will enrich the conversation. Um, Sayuri, you know, has this big picture perspective uh, about Japan. 
Masashi brings this this operations expertise, and and then Frank, um, you know, with this this lens of kind of the U.S. Japan bilateral relationship, and and thinking about things, you know, some of these moves from Japan in terms of the implications for the United States. So, with that introduction, I want to uh, jump into our first question. I want to first um, talk about uh, missile and missile defense activity. You know, it, around the same time that Japan released its its space policy, and that 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 included this 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 mention of studying uh, early warning satellites. Um, Japan's government also announced the the cancellation of uh, the procurement. Of the Aegis Ashore missile defense system, and then also um, swirling around this time were, were reports that Japan was interested in precision strike capabilities, um, particularly for uh, potential adversaries' missile sites pre-launch, what is sometimes called left of launch. So, you know, wh- how do we, what do we make sense? How do we make sense of of these missile developments? Sorry, again, I want I want to start with you. What what is Japan's strategy for for missile and missile defense? Right. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for for having me. Uh, So I'm sure that the recent steps taken by the Japanese government and all the rumors and whispers about potential decisions over missile defense policy and just defense policy in general are can be a little confusing from the outside. Uh, But uh, first of all, tackling the decision to cancel the Aegis Ashore system in June, um, I think it was described by the media as a bold decision by Minister Taro Kono. Maybe the personality of Minister Taro Kono as defense minister was somewhat important to understand this decision, but it also actually shows that the Japanese government has an increasingly sophisticated understanding and assessment of the rapidly evolving threats and geopolitical dynamics of the region. And this kind of understanding is not something that that was necessarily present 15 years ago or even a decade ago when um, different uh, bilateral dialogues between the U.S. and Japan um, started to pop up. Um, I'm particularly uh, thinking about the, the the deterrence dialogue, for example, or the space security dialogue. So um, MOD, the Ministry of Defense, has rightfully um, assessed that the threats posed by uh, ballistic missiles a few years ago when the Aegis Ashore decision was made has shifted considerably, and we have, again, a different situation in 2019-2020. So when the decision was first made in uh, 2016, um, North Korea's missile threat was imminent and the Japanese government was really expected to urgently uh, take uh, make a decision. But because Japan uh, needs to consider increasingly diverse types of threats, uh, not just ballistic missiles uh, now and for the future, I think the decision to scrap the Aegis Ashore system really demonstrates a good and detailed understanding of Japan's security needs that are evolving and the ability to, to be foresighted for the day to come. Um, you know, the Abe government might be thinking of reallocating the, the Aegis Ashore investment um, towards a comprehensive air and missile defense capability that addresses the full range of threats uh, that Japan is facing. Um, it also indicates that Japan has been steadily moving away from the reactive nature that characterized its foreign policy and its defense policy during the Cold War. Um, I want to add just one more thing, is that this move um, illustrates Japan's growing originality in, a, in its approach to defense. It's baby steps towards uh, a more leadership position within the alliance. So there certainly has been some frustration about President Trump among Japanese government officials, a frustration that has been expressed um, privately, mostly. However, I don't see the cancellation of Aegis Ashore system during the U.S. presidential election year as a move intended to dismiss this particular U.S. president. Um, I think the decision follows Japan's own trajectory 
trajectory of development of its national security and defense policy. But it, it remains to be seen how the, the missile defense policy will, uh, will end up going. Thank you. I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's, very yeah that's, that's very interesting. I want to turn it over I to wanted, Sashi. I, mean, I want pulling on that thread um, from, from Sayuri, like, do you think the, the cancellation of Aegis Ashore is because uh, Japan wants a more ambitious uh, missile defense policy, something more comprehensive? Um, or, or is it, I mean, again, from the outside, it looks like there's there's some zigzagging going on, right? Like, what is uh, what is your sense of the the direction that Japan's going with its missile missile defense policy? You know, there are these reports that there's going to be this new policy direction come out in September. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have some insight on what you think that might look like? Uh, thank you, Sam, uh, and thank you for inviting me uh, here. Uh, I think that uh, uh, at that time, the ice. Maybe I, sh- I should uh, clearly distinct to the, my personal comment and the some the, or more objective view what Japan's going to do. Uh, I think that at first, to be honest, I think the debate about Japan's missile defense policy and the limited strike capability uh, debate has not settled on what is the principal guiding factor in their proper capability and force sizing. In the first place, what triggered this comprehensive review of defense policy was the cancellation of the Aegis Ashore deployment plan by Defense Minister Kono in June, as Sayuri-san mentioned. So and at the same time, I would like to emphasize on the the unique uh, systems of uh, or in Japan, uh, which means that the, unlike the United States, the, which has the present presidential systems, uh, the timing of defense security strategy review is irregular. Uh, the basic plan on the space policy is no ex- ex- exception. Uh, maybe we are uh, discussing about later. The exception, one of the exception, is scheduled to be the uh, reviewed the regularly is the midterm midterm defense program, which is the five-year procurement or acquisition plan for defense equipment. But uh, even national security strategy and national defense program guideline, which is a capstone document of uh, Japan's defense strategy, and even basic policy on space policy have yet to be uh, decided when they will, will be reviewed. So of course that security environment surrounding Japan uh, has been changing and deteriorating rapidly over the past few years. Uh, but it was cancellation of Easy Ashore that directly led to the review of Japan's missile defense policy. Uh, in fact, the uh, consideration of alternative options for Easy Ashore appears to be proceeding a uh, laugh and ready in, le- in response to the budget request season in September, uh, for uh, based on the Japan's uh, preparing for the Japan uh, uh, Japan's fiscal year. So I think that in that reason, that good strategy is never coming from the domestic politics or budget-driven thinkings. Uh, as I will discuss, the sponsoring resource constraints are a very important factor. But because of the uh, these resource constraints, uh, Japan needs to allocate its resources based on the career strategy, prioritize its portfolio, and design in the strategy-driven policy. Uh, so, in my view, that uh, I think that uh, I, in my view, that there are four areas for evaluation of the introduction of Easy Ashore and its impact of the cancellation. Uh, first point is it has to enhance, enhance the ballistic missile defense capabilities as soon as possible. Uh, as Sayusa mentioned that uh, uh, North Korea and China, uh, their the missile capability is growing uh, now. And but at the same time, the second reason is that it should be adapt, adaptable and expandable to deal with the new threats such as cruise missiles, Chinese cruise missiles, or maneuverable ballistic missile warhead like a North Korean new short range missiles or uh, hypersonic glide weapons of uh, China's. Uh, third point is it must not press a further burden 
of maritime self-defense forces current ongoing operation, including ballistic missile defense. Uh, in other words, the Japanese government needed to establish a joint and integrated missile defense posture in both not only MSDF, but also uh, uh, air self-defense force, but also the, the ground self-defense force. Uh, the last reason is that it must be politically sustainable in their deployment and operation. I think that based on these reason, reasons and comparing other alternative options, uh, I think that person, personally, I think that Aegis Ashore was not best, but it was most reasonable option. So problem is that, uh, again, so uh, how do we design our cost-effective strategy against not only North Korea, but also for China? The problem is that we face to the, some very difficult challenges to allocate our limited resources uh, for just focus, not only focus on the defense capabilities, but also some limited, capa- limited strike offensive strike capabilities. Uh, so the problem is the, the before that talking about, before the, before the starting the discussion about specific weapon system issues that I think that more importantly the talking uh, discussing about deeper than the, what is our strategic objectives uh, to tracing those, those different type of, type, different type of these threats and challenges so that is the one of the uh, first important point to reviewing uh, and uh, what we see that the future depends uh, defense and uh, appropriate mix of the defense and offense capabilities. So I think that, uh, uh, so to be honest, I'm not sure, but uh, now it, the Japanese government, uh, step by step, they're considering the uh, realistic uh, way to get into taking the balance between the uh, defense and missile defense and the missile defeat, including the limited strike option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, I, I, I do at some point want to pull on this thread of, of kind of what what we actually think that might look like. Um, but I, I want to bring in Frank, and and I also just want to you know open this up to feel free all three of you to to ask questions to anyone um, during the conversation. But but Frank, oh, what do you think about this from a from a U.S. perspective? You know, if you were working on on the Hill. Um, and you saw these actions, you know, especially I think what, you know, pull, what, what Sayuri said about this being maybe a step towards some, you know, some Japan carving its own path. Um, you know, what, how should we think about this? How should U.S. be supporting, responding? Um, what, what's your take? Thanks so much, Sam, for the invitation to join this conversation. Uh, you know, looking at Japan's uh, investments in space, I think the most critical document really goes back to the 2016 Basic Space Plan. And it was that, that plan that articulated for the first time um, a commitment to national security uh, space as opposed to commercial space or science and exploration space. And uh, everything we're seeing today is flowing out of that 2016 commitment uh, by Japan, both to invest more in its space capabilities and also to essentially erase uh, the taboo uh, which had existed on security space investments by Japan uh, prior to 2016. And so when we talk about missile defense uh, in particular, uh, it, it's a logical outgrowth of Japan's uh, changing security environment, uh, the growth of more sophisticated North Korean missile threats, the obvious uh, more aggressive posture of China in the region on the East China Sea and South China Sea. Um, and also, I think we do have to factor in uh, a little bit of a hedging strategy by Prime Minister Abe, who is aware of um, more aware today than perhaps uh, he was when he took office um, of the um, mercurial nature uh, of the American president and also the uh, lack of constancy uh, in in American uh, uh, policy uh, toward the Asia-Pacific region. So I think um, 
Uh, missile defense in particular is fascinating to us because uh, we know that it is an area that Japan had relied uh, exclusively upon American assets in the past. And um, I see this new investment uh, in a similar vein to QZSS. Um, on the one hand, we can interpret it as a sign of deeper Japanese investment in the alliance, uh, the desire to build complementary or even in some cases redundant capacity uh, into the alliance so that the alliance cumulative deterrence, strength, military capabilities can be can be enhanced. Um, QZSS you know, gives Japan that ability to essentially complement uh, American GPS. Um, but on the other hand, it also can be interpreted um, as uh, Japan taking at least one step toward a go it alone capability, uh, which is a kind of a hedge against the possibility that the US might not always be there or might not always prioritize uh, investments in uh, missile, deten missile detection capabilities in the Far East that Japan would like to have uh, on its own. Uh, I also think that um, my understanding of what this means is very much informed by uh, something I learned from uh, Yamakawa Sensei, uh, the head of JAXA. Uh, as a participant in our uh, US-Japan Space Forum five years ago, he, he really stressed the idea that Japan's total budgetary uh, allocations towards space are of course quite limited, uh, about 10% maybe of the US investment. And as a consequence of that uh, limitation, Japan has to make tough choices. And so, you know, even the decision on Aegis Ashore, um, I think has to be factored in here as partly uh, scarce resource management. Um, and it, it says something about both uh, the desire to have a, a uh, cohesive long-term uh, national security plan uh, to respond to their changing environment, but also uh, that when it came, when push came to shove, um, the investment in an indigenous um, Japanese uh, uh, earth observation, missile tracking capability uh, took a higher priority to uh, Aegis Ashore uh, defensive systems at this time. And um, I wouldn't rule out Japan returning to Asia's ashore, perhaps downstream, uh, maybe when they have been managed to click off some of these other more immediate priorities. I, I don't know that the Aegis Ashore decision is a final one, and I'd be very interested to, to maybe get Musashi's uh, views on this, on whether he thinks that the Aegis Ashore decision is, is once and done, or whether it's the kind of decision that might be revisited um, in the future in, in the face of a changing threat environment. Great, great, great. Um, Frank, those are good comments. And uh, there's some themes there that I think we should we should revisit. And and you were able, and you you made the connection to to missile warning, to missile detection, to early warning. So I you know I want to ask I want to ask you all how you think this fits. You know, a lot of um, Japan Japan studying uh, early warning capabilities with uh, with the United States. You know, a lot of Japan space security activity in the past has been focused on missile threats, you know, and this dates back to its 1998 decision to acquire its own um, intelligence reconnaissance satellites, its information gathering satellites, which I think was in part uh, at least driven um, by a, a series of missile tests from North Korea in the 1990s. You know, it is, is the interest in early warning um, driven by a heightened sense of missile threats? Um, is this or is this uh, a technological opportunity to pursue new capabilities in space security? Um, a piece in, uh, in the Nikkei um, Asian Review in August suggested that Japan and the United States could partner together with ASDA's, uh, with the Space Development Agency's planned tracking layer. Is Japan thinking of, of early warning as part of its missile and missile defense activity, um, or is it more discreetly seen as a space security opportunity and therefore uh, treated differently. Um, uh, Sayuri, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. 
Um, so I can't speak about the specific technical merits of early warning satellites for Japan. Maybe Masashi uh, could be uh, could address that question. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, but um, what I would like to say is that um, although. Japan has been moving towards more independent military system. A central point of these systems is always their interoperability and compatibility with the United States. And having the know-how independently is something fundamental for the Japanese. But uh, during my interviews in Japan is past couple of years, um, I was looking at nuclear policy, but whenever um, the interviewer, the interviewees uh, talked about Japan developing new military systems, the phrase that I would hear over and over again was in the context of the alliance, within the alliance, in cooperation with the U.S., along with the U.S. So many different ways, but um, to, to send a, the same message, right, uh, in the context of the alliance. So where would Japan's early warning system fit in? Well, if you look at the big picture of Japan's evolution of defense and security policy, I would say that it partly fits um, with um, what we have always witnessed, a system that's independent from the U.S., but still perfectly compatible with the U.S. systems. And these discussions and debates uh, might be part all, also of um, Japan's bigger hedging strategy, as Frank uh, mentioned earlier, that allows Japan to buy time to take some independent steps for, forward in the military sphere, sphere while also um, maintaining a very strong relationship and alliance with the U.S. So for these satellites, I think Japan is expected to test the sensor uh, sensor un until 2024. And then after that, it will decide whether it will launch uh, an early warning satellite in orbit. So I think until that happens, there will be lots of aspects to consider. Um, what Frank said, also technical, budgetary, and we'll need to see how the timeline timeline um, unfolds. So this sort of duality in rhetoric and in decisions in security and defense policies has always been a central aspect of Japan's trajectory. And that hedging strategy has served Japan well in different aspects of its security policy. I'm notably thinking of nuclear deterrence as well. Um, so I think that's uh, where the discussion about early warning system comes from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Th um, th thank you. That, th that was, that you, was that, really that good. Was, that was really yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to turn to Masashi, um, and I, I'd also like you to, to take Frank's question of, of do you think that Japan will revisit Aegis Ashore? But, but also, I mean, you, know, you and I have talked about, I, I think one thing that, that um, Sayuri said that, that, we, that you and I have talked about is that even when Japan has developed these independent space security capabilities, you know, a requirement is compatibility with, with U.S. systems. And, and we shouldn't overthink, um, perhaps, uh, when Japan is, is developing some independent systems, although, although I, I think it's important to consider. Um, I also think, we, you know, the, the, the space policy only says that Japan is studying early warning. I think Sayuri was right about the time frames. This, we shouldn't put too much stock uh, into... Uh, a sentence in a space policy. It's a very Washington thing to do. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I do want to get your thoughts about it. Um, you know, is Japan thinking about this as part of, I mean, is, is this going to be part of this conversation that's going to manifest in this, this, this new review that you talked about in September? Or is this treated differently? Is, is it considered as part of a space security capability that perhaps is distinct from the missile and missile defense conversations? You know, is it and I, I think about this in Japan because of what Frank said, because there's been uh, so much focus on, you know, in Japan, uh, what constitutes a space security capability, right? Like the, the space security capabilities are treated differently, I think partly because of the legacy of the Peaceful Purposes Resolution. Um, so is this, 
you know, is this part of th- that first question, right? Is this part of the, the broader missile, missile defense activity policy, or is this uh, something discreet? Uh, Masashi, turn to you. Yeah, this is the very good and important and difficult questions. The, uh, one thing I want to, to make clear that uh, there is very the little time lag between the decision to cancellation uh, of the deployment of the is is ashore, and the announcement of the current latest uh, basic plan on the space policy, uh, which include that decision of the uh, going forward for the, our Japan's uh, indigenous uh, early warning capabilities. Uh, Defense Minister Kono has informed very limited number of people uh, about its the its social cancellation issues. So, the, in general, Japanese bureaucratic uh, conventions that do not allow for such a quick adjustment of the uh, research and development programs. So, therefore, uh, there is no direct uh, causal link between the specification uh, of uh, acquisition of the early warning capabilities in basic in the the basic plan on space policy and the review of missile, uh, missile defense program, include the cance- cance- cancellation of easy ashore and the, uh, make, uh, making the, the alternative options. Uh, in the first place, the, let me clearly, uh, let me check that clearly that uh, the ongoing, the current, the MOD and JAXA uh, combined program. The JMOD has begun research and development of the dual band infrared sensor technologies, uh, the basis for the early warning capabilities uh, in uh, 2005. Uh, and it's, it was originally planned to test an exper- experimental uh, inflated sensor on the on board the JAXA's advanced optical sensor satellites as a hosted as a hosted payload. Uh, what the uh, latest the basic plan on space policy decided is the uh, we will Japan will use that the result of that demonstration to pursue further early warning capabilities. So, uh, is it actually? It is not a new decision, uh, but it's more of the evolutionary program that an extension of what Japan have been uh, that what what the Japan have been doing. Uh, so the, as the Sayuri Sam mentioned, uh, actually also uh, Sam mentioned that uh, now is the uh, we have to think about the what capabilities we needed and uh, under under the, the limited defense resources and uh, at the same time we needed to considering about the, how do we maintain how do we upgrade into the the US Japan bilateral relation US Japan lines. I think that uh, Japanese politicians are slowly learning the reality and are coming to understand that they're having a completely independent capabilities, uh, which include either early warning and strike capability too uh, from the United States is not feasible or effective. Uh, in other words, that there is no doubt that cooperation with the United States will be even more important. Uh, however, that uh, Sayuri-san pointed out that there are still a number of problems or opportunities around uh, how to do that. I think this is my personal opinion, but the first option would be to participate in the U.S. space program, such as the the SDA's Tranche Constellation Program, or participate in the the Missile Defense Agency, the HPTSS, such as Hypersonic Ballistic Tracking Space Sensors Program. Uh, another option, the second option is to create separate system with interoperability, like relationship between US GPS and Japan's QZSS. And even that uh, it's in more detail as a result of sharing financial burden uh, to with the United States, the, we still have considering some other type, other kind of the challenges or the problems. For instance, how much information will Japan be able to acquire from the United States? Uh, how much will Japan be involved in the population of entire satellite systems? 
Uh, and to what extent will Japan's defense and space industries be involved? Uh, from the a system perspective, there is also the question of how many functions to put on the single satellite. Uh, so a multifunctional hosted payload uh, can reduce the launch cost, but however, if that the satellite is exposed that and attacked, the multifunctionally uh, will be lost at the same time. So since the goal of the constellation is to lower the cost of the satellite system itself, I think the challenge will be will also be to determine uh, how much the performance, how much capability we want to the single satellite. So these systems, so first, the my point, my understanding is the, the U.S. Japan, the, even if Japan acquiring to the early warning capabilities or some strike capability or other uh, targeting capabilities, if the 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 useful under the U.S. Japan a deeper U.S. Japan a consultation mechanism, but after that uh, we need to uh, uh, care about the what the our objectives and the, our role and our the role and mission and capability sharing in specific operation or some specific operational scenario or crisis scenario that is uh, uh, my current view that how depends the space field is basically before we going yeah that, that, that's super interesting um, it, Frank I, I want to get your perspective because because uh, Masashi just presented kind of two options that both um, have important implications for the United States, right? So, so uh, you know, on the on the one hand, let's say the second option, Japan develops an independent system. You know, early warning satellites is is a capability you might not expect a close ally of the United States to develop because the United States already has it and it's very expensive. Um, and, and as we reported in May. Um, when Japan was consider- considering developing early warning satellites before, the argument was that Japan should have its own independent capabilities for, for certain critical missions, this perhaps being one. And the argument against it that, that won out was that we should instead invest in this space domain awareness capability, this deep space radar that will uh, detect objects in geo, um, because that could enhance and complement what uh, the U.S. And, and, the, and other allies have. Um, so, so that's thinking about the, the second option. And, and then the first option he presented was, you know, this is perhaps could be part of a U.S. Uh, and J- Japanese system, right? Like this could be um, this could be burden sharing. This could be, you know, the policy does say that Japan would be studying these capabilities in cooperation with the United States. And then as noted, this, this, um, this Nikkei Asian Review report, Suggested that Japan and the United States could work together on a proliferated Leo architecture, as as um, uh, under the the auspices of what of what SDA is trying to do with its tracking layer. So, so I mean, you know, does this, you know, I think there's two questions, right? Does this reflect an interest in developing more independent capabilities, or conversely, does this reflect interest for more extensive collaboration? And, and does it really matter? Uh, because either way, they're going to be thinking about trying to, you know, make sure their system is interoperable with the U.S. And, and Frank, I, I'd be curious from your perspective of, of whether Japan developing early warning capabilities has come up in the, the U.S.-Japan space fora that, that you host, understanding you couldn't attribute uh, statements to individuals. But, you know, I'd be curious if that has come up. And if so, what did those exchanges look like between the U.S. Uh, and J- Japanese um, experts? Thanks so much, Sam. I, I think you've really captured the duality here, but I, I want to encourage all of us not to think of it as a dichotomous choice between Japan going it alone or Japan being more deeply integrated into the U.S. Uh, uh, technologies and systems. I, I so much want to echo uh, Sayori's point about all of Japan's uh, strategic level defense commitments really do need to be understood as enmeshing Japan in the context of the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, And space is a strategic uh, theater of operations uh, akin to nuclear power. And uh, so any investment Japan makes in space, I think, really does still need to be understood in that context of the U.S.-Japan alliance. And and I don't believe that this is, you know, Japan t- trying to decouple. Um, but, but again, these are not uh, dichotomous choices. 
bridges between building independent capabilities that can hedge against American inconstancy, uh, also signaling to Japan's neighbors in Asia its commitment to meeting its own defense challenges without being entirely dependent upon the U.S. versus uh, demonstrating to the United States the very robust capability that Japan can bring to the table uh, in areas like space situational awareness and ground-based and, and even space-based uh, observation systems to track orbital debris, uh, Earth observation satellites and sensing satellite technology that can be part of a missile defense system <clears throat> or, or QZSS and, and precision targeting capabilities for munitions that that kind of a system does provide uh, to the U.S.-Japan alliance. In, in at least in theory. Uh, I think that we need to understand these investments um, uh, not as a choice between go it alone and integration, but really as a part of an industrial policy, an alliance policy, and a foreign policy um, that speaks to a growing threat environment uh, for the nation of Japan uh, and their wish to signal uh, to potential adversaries both uh, that they are all in in terms of building the capabilities they need to ensure the defense of the Japanese islands, uh, but also signaling to the United States um, that they are going to be strategically integrated with us in ways that, that really run deeper than a marine base at Futenma. Uh, uh, when you talk about you know, integrated space capabilities on communications, on um, missile detection and warning, uh, on missile defense, um, that's a level of strategic integration with the United States uh, that Japan did not have heretofore. Uh, and I think that, uh, to me, the driving narrative is one of Japan aligning itself with the United States uh, to meet the emerging security challenges uh, in East Asia. And uh, this commitment to increase the, the no number of uh, Earth observation satellites, uh, the commitment to uh, invest more in space, uh, to put a Japanese astronaut as part of Artemis and, and part of a potential future a U.S. moon mission. I think all of it really speaks to uh, Abe's abiding uh, commitment to the <laughs> U.S.-Japan alliance, uh, and especially this notion that that you know, an alliance of hope uh, that is going to uh, endure for many, many years to come. So I, I hate to, you know, I'm not trying to be too cute here in trying to avoid your, your excellent question, Sam, about uh, which is it. Um, but I, I think it's both. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think we need to avoid uh, falling into the trap of trying to characterize it as, as uh, one or the other. And I'm not I'm not too worried. I guess you can sense. I'm not too worried that, that this investment by Japan will either result in Japan achieving a capability that the United States would somehow be nervous about, nor am I worried that it represents a vote of no confidence by Japan, you know, in the U.S. commitment to Japan's security. Yeah, that's that's extremely well put, and, and I completely agree. I mean, I, I think I think we all agree on this point. Um, you know, I, this is a uh, again a, a road that I, I I traveled down with the paper that we published in May about you know what is you know, Japan has been sort of moving towards more independent space security capabilities for a really long time. Uh, you know, what does this mean? And and the truth is is that everybody everybody said regardless of of which capability we're talking about, uh, a requirement is trying to facilitate uh, as much uh, collaboration and cooperation and compatibility with the U.S. as possible. And in some ways, they're developing systems that they think might might allow them to participate better with the, with the United States. And uh, I mean, certainly the the space to, the deep space radar, I think, is is going to be uh, hugely consequential. You hear U.S. officials uh, mention that system, and and Japan uh, is also launching. Um, uh, U.S. posted uh, hosted payloads, which will be the first time U.S. national security uh, payloads on its next uh, on its next um, QZSS uh, launches, which will be the first time that a a foreign launcher and foreign satellite has hosted U.S. national security payloads. So again, pretty. I think it speaks to the the strength of uh, of the alliance. Um, Sam, can I can I jump your, in with a, a non? Please, yeah, yeah, yeah. A non-space example. I mean, 
what what this calls to mind for me is Japan's decision in the Reagan era to expand their naval uh, zone of uh, responsibility a thousand nautical miles uh, beyond the the Japanese Isles, and at the time. That commitment to Aegis and to building eight Aegis uh, squadrons uh, capable of patrolling anti-submarine and, and uh, 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 aerial surveillance out to a thousand nautical miles, um, you know, represented a significant investment by the, the nation of Japan in the maritime self-defense forces. It wasn't because they were decoupling from Reagan. It was the opposite. It was basically a kind of a burden sharing and an investment in a, in a new defense capability um, in the context of the Cold War against the Soviets. Uh, but nonetheless, it had the effect of building a significant new indigenous Japanese maritime strength. You know, And so I'm sure for Japan's neighbors at the time, uh, eyebrows were raised. Um, but Japan had the luxury of embedding that new capability within the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, and, and that uh, for both the Japanese public, which might have been uh, reluctant uh, to see such an investment, and also for uh, any in, in Washington who might have been concerned that somehow Japan was building a, an autonomous capability that would be a threat uh, to uh, regional stability. Uh, the fact that the alliance exists um, made that investment uh, um, uh, one that served multiple purposes for the nation of Japan. So I know that's, you know, we're, we're talking space versus, you know, conventional uh, maritime yeah. assets, but I think, I think this investment can be understood in a similar, in a similar way. Thanks, Frank. I think that's a great analogy. So I hate to do this because I'm loving the conversation, but my producer is telling me that we are out of time. Um, so I want to I want to thank the three of you for your really insightful uh, comments today. I thought it was uh, it was a really uh, fascinating discussion, and and I hope to engage with the three of you in a discussion along these lines sometime in the future. So with that, um, I will turn it to Rebecca. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sam, and special guest Frank. Masashi and Sayuri. We are so appreciative to have you here today. I know Corbin Dallas really enjoyed this episode in particular. As always, you can find us. We're on Twitter, hashtag the space policy show. Ask our experts all the questions you want. You can put your questions in the dialogue box below on Vimeo. And you can engage with us on our website. We're at aerospace.org slash policy. Click stay up to date and Corbin Dallas will send you the latest news. Until next time, take care.